Alrighty. Quick thing on the exam for everybody. Uh, first of all, the structure of the exam. There's 20 multiple choice questions, each worth one mark. I don't have any negative marking in it, so basically you try to get the best answer you can. It's based on the lectures and more earlier lectures than later ones, as it happens. But uh, if you study them well, you should do fairly well in that section. The person who topped the course the first year I gave it, which was about two years ago, got 19 out of 20 for that section. So it's a fairly reasonable guide to how well you follow the lectures. Uh, then there's five short answers, each worth four marks. They're the same, essentially the same as the readings you've been doing so far during the subject. And it's probably fairly good odds you would have done at least one or two of the ones I'm going to be put up in a, in a moment. And one essay worth 20 marks. So each there's three sections. You've got three hours, pretty much allow one hour for each to get through the model of choice more quickly. Then you've got more time for the other, other two sections. Closed book, you can't take any notes in with you, but of course what you read beforehand, you'll already know the questions. And these are the five readings I want you to write uh, basically a, a critical summary of. So Keynes and the General Theory of Employment in 1937. Minsky with the financial instability hypothesis and interpretation of Keynes. Basil Moore's work on endogenous money, explaining the mechanisms behind endogenous money creation. Alan Blinders, empirical research into where, uh, how prices are set in a capitalist economy. It's basically chapter four, not the rest of the book, just chapter four. And finally, Graziani, theory of money, uh, product, money theory of production. I'm pretty certain they're all on the website. If there's not one of them there, let me know and I'll whack it up on the, uh, on the, on the uh, view side for you. The essay. Okay, I'm told us the essay question is longer than some essay answers. So if you take a look at the uh, extremes of theory about how to deal with the crisis, you've got everything from the modern monetary theory crowd who say that uh, all you've got to do is run a large enough government deficit, and there's Mosler's Law from uh, Warren Mosler's website, through to the austerity mob who uh, first of all call it reverse Ricardian equivalence and now calls it, I think, expansionary fiscal consolidation, wonderful jargon they can come up with, that austerity will cause the public to spend more now. A couple of references you can search out in the meantime. So I want you to assess both of those in light of what you've learned about endogenous money in this course and make suggestions on that basis about what the public sector should do. And you don't have to think about monetary and fiscal policy. You can consider legislative reforms and so on as well. So you can see it's related to the essay we've already done. So a fair bit of the research you've done there and the opinions you've formed there, you can transfer across the essay as well. Don't worry about taking this all down, it'll be up on views later on today. So, that's the exam. Any questions more about that, ask me during the break. So, a recap of what we've got so, so far. I showed you the circuit model last week. It's still skeletal, but I've showed you you can actually reach very different conclusions about economic policy from that model, even the simple stage I showed you to last week. I've extended it to include multiple commodities, input-output dynamics, and so on. And next week, I'll show you how to, to extend it to include fixed capital uh, as, as well and model the financial instability hypothesis using it. What I intend doing this week is going through the financial instability hypothesis and showing where it came from. So it was developed by Hyman Minsky on a very simple initial proposition. And that was that capitalism has had severe depressions throughout its history. If you look back in the 19th century in particular, when it really is impossible to blame the government for what happened in the 19th century because the government sector was trivial compared to the size it got to be in the 20th century, there was a depression every 10 to 20 years. And the Great Depression of the 1930s was merely the biggest that there'd ever been up until that point. So Minsky argued, well, since capitalist economies have shown they can have depressions, then you therefore have to have a theory which can generate a depression as one of its possible states. If your theory can't do that, it might be a nice looking little model, but it's not a theory of capitalism. And for that reason, he rejected the neoclassical synthesis as he knew it at the time, and he even more so rejected the nonsense that's spouted today by neoclassical economists because you can't get a depression in that system. Now, the theory he put together lay outside the mainstream. And the real inspiration, the key inspirations he had were Marx, Schumpeter, Keynes, and Irving Fisher. Now, you won't find a single reference to Marx in any of Minsky's writings for the simple reason that he was an academic, became an academic during the McCarthyist period in the, in the Americas 
When have you heard of Senator Eugene McCarthy at all? This class? Okay, too young. Uh, check out Wikipedia. He was a a, a rabid anti anti communist who got elected to the American Senate and a fraud at the same time, and claimed to have a list of known communist sympathisers in the government sector back in the time when the battle between uh, the American free market system and Russia was seen as the, the key battle, and managed to generate such a level of hysteria in America that it was dangerous to even admit you'd even seen the cover of a book by Marx, let alone read it. If you'd done that, that was the end of your career, uh, certainly in academia, also in Hollywood. So take a good look at uh, McCarthyism in the Wikipedia. You'll get an idea of the hysteria that ruled at that particular period. So, though he didn't actually ever mention Marx, he certainly read Marx. For a start, his parents met at the Communist Party dance, which is a pretty good start. And uh, having met with his family, his son Alan rebelled against dad, as often uh, you know, sons do against fathers and late in life became interested in economics and asked, asked his dad, what book should I read first? And Hyman went to the study, this is uh, Mark Allen told me, he went to the library, came back with a book and said, this is the one you should read and gave him a copy of Das Kapital, volume one. Now, if you do read Marx, don't stop at volume one. Most so-called Marxists only read that far. The most useful stuff in Marx is actually in volumes two and three of Capital and in the Grundrisse and theories, volumes one to three of theories of surplus value, which was his encyclopedic coverage of history, the history of economic thought as it was at the time he wrote. And you've got a very strong basis for credit view of capitalism in that and not the uh, stylized labour theory of value nonsense that most Marxists go on with. So I don't, don't talk a great deal about Marx here. I do in my history of economic thought courses. But if you want to pick the key reference that I think you can see uh, uh, Minsky is extending was Fisher's work on debt deflation during the Great Depression. Let's start there. Now, Irving Fisher, in my opinion, was the Paul Krugman of his time in several ways. First of all, he was a famous neoclassical economist and he developed the early 90s, 1900s precursor to the efficient markets hypothesis nonsense you guys have been taught in conventional finance courses. He was also, unlike most economists, including Krugman, he was actually practically useful. I'm also practically useless, so I'm not going to put a post up in Fisher's camp there. He was a tinkerer. He was actually also a fan, fan of the teetotal movement, a uh, vegetarian, quite an eccentric personality. But he was a tinkerer in his own backyard and he invented the Rolodex. Have you heard of what a Rolodex is? Okay, some of you have. It's a, a mechanical precursor to the iPad. Okay, a rotating card system with which you could bring up people's names in alphabetical order in a card system. He sold that to the Rand Corporation, I believe, got an issue of shares as a result of that, became wealthy in his own right. And that's, unlike most economists, he actually made something useful. He was also a columnist, I think, on the New York Times. It might have been the Wall Street Journal. I tend to forget that. I think it is the New York Times. And he was a bull in the stock market. And he believed in his own theory. I can actually say he believed in his own bullshit, I suppose. That's what it turned out to be. He thought the market growth in the 1920s reflected the future prospects for the American economy. And he put that point vigorously uh, in his columns. He was also heavily invested in the market and back in the 1920s you could take out margin loans with a 10% deposit. Now these days it's been reduced, it was reduced actually to 50% which I think was actually more reasonable. Of course re in recent times it's come down to 30% and even lower so that we've, we've got a similar sort of leverage now under people's share market positions that we had back then. With those huge margin loans he actually had a portfolio worth in today's terms roughly $100 million. So he was seriously invested and seriously wealthy before the stock market crash. And he had a theory that supported his position as well, a bit like the guys around long-term capital management. And extended the standard supply and demand analysis of neoclassical economics to finance and saw the rate of interest as the price, as he put it, in the exchange between present and future goods. And he saw three forces that needed to determine that price. One was and I'm emphasising important words here, a subjective preference that individuals had, not companies, subjective as well, not objective, subjective preference for individuals for present consumption over future consumption determined the supply of money on the market. Then the objective possibility for profitable investments determined the demand for funds from corporations. 
and the market brought the two into equilibrium. Now, I'm emphasising the Sivan objective there because that's the reverse of conventional economic theory. When you look at standard supply and demand analysis, if you're looking, say, at the market for apples, then supply is objective and demand is subjective. Okay, the supply reflects the objective conditions of production. The demand reflects the subjective preferences consumers have for apples. So that's the standard analysis in supply and demand. But when you look at both finance and labour, two crucial uh, markets in the capitalist economy, in both those cases that's reversed. Objective factors determine demand, subjective factors determine supply. So you're flipping your causal argument around. Now it's pretty hard, you'd imagine, to flip your argument around and still get the same result. But that's what they pretend to have done. So the way it works in, in finance is that Fisher argued the subjective preferences individ individuals have now for f present goods over future goods determines how much they buy now versus whether they decide instead to supply their money to the market and earn interest on it. So if you have a low time preference, if you're really quite, if you don't particularly worry whether you get you know, a chocolate bar today or a chocolate bar tomorrow, then you prefer to lend now rather than consume and you're, you're more likely to be a lender. If on the other hand you desperately want that chocolate now, then you're likely to be a consumer now and you're therefore likely to be a borrower. So that's looking at level of individuals. But the, and that's saying that if you look at it at that level of lending to borrowing, the way that neoclassicals normally think about it, it talks about lending for a consumer with a, a low time preference to one with a high time preference. What Fisher was really looking at was the household sector or the, 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 uh, the savers lending to the firm sector as the borrowers. And that therefore means that on the demand side, you're looking at what firms think they can do with money they borrow. And that comes down to what he called the marginal return over cost, which modern, so-called modern neoclassical economists call the mar marginal productivity of investment. And that determines the demand you might have for funds. So it's, it's how profitable you expect a particular investment to be, and therefore the internal rate of return you're expecting on that investment. Now, if you expect a high internal rate of return, you've got a high demand for funds. A low return, you're going to have a low demand for funds. So your willingness to, to borrow or to lend is not enough. You've got to have projects you can invest that money in that are going to bring a return. And the market then brings those two forces together. So if there's a, a high rate of interest, that means that even those who've got a very high time preference are likely to think, boy, I can get 20% on my money, I'll leave that chocolate bar for tomorrow and I'll put the money, I'll lend the money out instead. So there'll be a high supply of funds. If, on the other hand, the rate of interest in the market is quite low, then only those who've got a very low time preference are going to even consider lending money, so the supply of funds is going to be quite small. On the demand side, if you have a high rate of interest, that means most projects are going to have an internal rate of return lower than the rate of interest, and there won't be much demand for funds. But if you have a low rate of interest, then even projects with a low internal rate of return are likely to be uh, net present value positive with that rate of interest they have to pay, so the demand for funds will be high. So that's, that's the way you get the conventional results out of the reversal of subjective and objective preferences. Now, it's just like the standard supply and demand arguments so far, but as e even having done that and shoehorning an inversion of the causal factors to, into the same old model, there's still a couple of things you can't get away from. Because to get that equilibrium interest rate, you still can't get away from time. Well, if you look at the usual market of supply and demand, it abstracts from time completely. It talks about equilibrium price with supply and demand written in abstraction from time completely, which is one of the many things I attack in debunking economics. But time's explicitly part of an exchange in finance. You're borrowing money now and promising to repay it later, plus pay interest over time. So you can't avoid the time dimension. Now, how did he handle something he couldn't avoid? Well, he's a neoclassical economist, isn't he? He made an assumption. Two of them, actually. The market must be cleared, and cleared with respect to every interval of time. So it's always in equilibrium. And secondly, debts are always repaid. That was a fabulous couple of assumptions to make in 1930, wasn't it? He'd actually first written this as his PhD thesis, which was published, I think, in 1907. 
and he believed it didn't get a wide enough coverage at the time, so he rewrote it and republished it, uh, starting in the 19, late 1920s. It came out in 1930. Fisher was blessed with disastrous timing. Because, and also, not only disastrous timing, disastrous public, public uh, relations as well, because being a newspaper columnist, in October 15th, 1929, he argued the stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. That's normally all you ever see of the quote. He kept on going and saying he never thought there'd be a 50 or 60 point break, which was the level that a bear, a bear market commentator was making at much the same time. And he said he expected to see the stocks a good deal higher than it is today within a few months. Well, eight days later, the market fell 10% in one day, which was virtually all of the 50 to 60 point break that Babson said he expected to see over a more substantial period of time than one day. And four years later, it was down 87%. And he'd lost his 10 million, which is equivalent to losing $100 million today. He was effectively bankrupt. The reason he wasn't actually put into bankruptcy was his wife uh, was, had a, his wife's sister was wealthy. She lent him the money to get through his problems. His debt transferred to her, and she forgave those debts on his deathbed. And Columbia University gave him a house to live in because he lost his house as well. They can imagine the personal shock that he went through at the time. He was totally blown away by what happened, and for a while he was arguing this is all mad, irrational, etc., etc. Uh, but give him his credit, he came back later, and I'll show you that in a moment. This is the scale of crash he was dealing with. This is a, a log plot of the Dow Jones from 1914 through to 2010, and you can see the scale of the downturn in the 19, in 1929 to 1932. It began at 382, that was the peak, not actually in October, a couple of months earlier. By the time it hit its bottom, it was below 42. And it took about three, two and a half, three years. Now, that there were rallies, of course, which sucked people back into the market at various times. They thought, oh, the best is over. You know, the market's rising. You better get on the ground floor, otherwise you'll lose your money. Well, up it goes, and then that rally disappeared. Another one came along, and that one disappeared. Another big plunge, and the next rally came along, and that didn't last very long. That disappeared. Down we go again, another rally, bye-bye rally, continuing to suck people back in. Now, Fisher couldn't afford to be sucked back in, he'd already lost most of it back in 1929. By the time it was all over, it was down 89% from its peak. And it took 25 years for the index to return back to that same level, but of course, that's the index, which is redefined depending on what are the regarded as the top 30 companies by the people putting together the Dow Jones Index. So the companies in 1929 weren't the companies in the index in 1954 when it returned back to its previous value. Quite a few had gone bankrupt and most of the others had been kicked out of the index. So if you actually had shares that were in the index in 1929, it probably would have taken you through about 2007 to get your money back, by which time the next market crash began. The buy and hold didn't work. So he went from being a sage to a laughing stock. Really was, if you actually search for the world's worst predictions, Fisher's is one of the many that comes up, including the chief of IBM saying he reckoned to see a total world demand forever for computers of about 10 or so units. Uh, but in the aftermath, he developed a theory to try to explain where the crash came from, which he called the debt deflation theory of great depressions. And it fundamentally was based on rejecting those two assumptions that led him so badly astray in his initial paper, because he assumed equilibrium all the way through. A typical neoclassical thing, they don't believe they can model anything unless they assume equilibrium to begin with, which of course is the reverse of the real situation in genuine, dynamic, uh, genuine models, genuine dynamic systems. Now what he said was the real world, if it was in equilibrium, would only be there for a very short time because disturbances are bound to come along. And that he said therefore any variable is almost always above or below the ideal equilibrium. So even if you have a model that says the system will tend there, you have to accept that 99.999% of the time it won't be there. Therefore, disequilibrium is the rule. And you need a disequilibrium theory to understand what's going on. And the key forces he saw as being the, the, the disequilibriums that mattered were debt and prices. He said the two dominant factors that caused a depression were over-indebtedness to start with and deflation following soon after. And he mentioned overinvestment and overspeculation are important, but they wouldn't matter as much if they weren't conducted with borrowed money, 
And I think the next line is one of the most poignant lines in, in economics. He was not a particularly good writer, fairly clumsy, fairly pedestrian. But this is written from the heart. I fancy that overconfidence seldom does any great harm except when, as and if, it beguiles its victims into debt. And he was clearly writing from the heart when he wrote that. So when you have overconfidence leading to over-indebtedness, you then get a chain reaction. Debt, debt liquidation leading to distressed selling. So firms that are in debt reduce their prices to try to bring in customers, but in so doing, and then paying their debt down, they reduce the amount of deposit currency in circulation, and that contracts the money supply. So prices fall. And what he says here, a swelling of the dollar, what he means is the real price levels fall, so you can buy more with the same amount of, of dollar, which sounds good for people who've got jobs and so on. But of course, what it also does is increase the debt burden. Price levels have fallen, your debts remain much the same, you've paid it down a bit, your debt burden actually rises. So there's a fall in the worth of businesses, there are bankruptcies that cause chain reactions and knock out even <coughs> solvent firms. Profits fall, and therefore, firms that are making a loss reduce output, reduce employment, and you get pessimism, loss of confidence, hoarding of the currency, and ultimately, as well, complicated changes in the rate of interest. So even though the nominal rate might fall towards 3%, 2 or 3%, which is about as low as you can get the nominal rate down to be, the real rate will rise because deflation is added to the interest rate. And back when he wrote, the rate of deflation was as high as 10% per annum in the first two years of the Great Depression. So the nominal, the real rate of interest was about 13%, which is huge. Now, it's a non-equilibrium uh, theory. And if you take a look at Bernanke's attempt to understand Fisher, he completely leaves this out in the couple of paragraphs he devotes to supposedly discussing uh, uh, Fisher's theory. So disequilibrium is essential. And he makes a beautiful statement about why you have to have a disequilibrium analysis, even starting from the belief that equilibrium can be assumed for most variables. He says, therefore, if you don't have any disturbances, yes, OK, you'll get to equilibrium. But he said, but the exact equilibrium is seldom reached and never long maintained. Because new disturbances are, humanly speaking, sure to come along. And therefore, as I quoted earlier, any variable is going to be above or below its ideal equilibrium. So there has to be, in other words, over or under production, over or under everything at all periods of time. So you have to think in a disequilibrium sense about the economy. He said, it's absurd to assume that variables in the economy are going to be in equilibrium as it is to assume that the Atlantic Ocean can never be without a wave. It's one of the best statements possible for saying disequilibrium analysis is vital to understand economics, which is why neoclassicals don't understand capitalism. So he explained two classes of events using his theorem. One is an ordinary cycle where there's deflation or debt, excessive debt, but not both, uh, and depressions where you have both at the same time. And the argument was that with, uh, with only one, you'll get cycles. So with either over indebtedness or deflation, growth will eventually correct the problem. And he said, it's more like a stable equilibrium. You rock the boat, it returns back to its centre point again. But when you have both together, I call this Fisher's paradox. The more debtors pay, the more they owe. They reduce their debt levels, but the price level and output falls faster, so the debt burden actually rises. And I've now, I'll show you next week empirical data to confirm it's what happened during the Great Depression. The nominal level of debt was re down, reduced from 1930 on, but the real debt burden actually rose from 175% when the crisis began to 235%, because the fall in GDP, both, both in terms of physical output and also the price level, was faster than the rate of repayment of debt. Now, his new theory was ignored because it didn't fit the neoclassical mindset. Do it. It's in this nasty thing called disequilibrium. Can't have that. Uh, and they made the old theory the basis of modern finance. Right, right at about, 1950, about 1955, 60, you still saw Fisher's pre-Great Depression articles being, pub being uh, cited in the literature. Then it died out after Sharp and the mob came along with their so-called improved version. So the debt deflation theory was grabbed hold of and improved by Minsky. Uh, but some years later. Now, Fisher himself, as well as being ignored because he was non-neoclassical, was also ignored because Keynes completely overshadowed him. 
And this is a pity. It would have been better if there'd been some synergy between Fisher and Keynes, because I think actually in explaining the Great Depression, Fisher may have did a better job of it than Keynes did. But they were largely unaware of each other's work because writing in different, uh, different continents, uh, back when they didn't have the internet, you didn't have any way of transmitting documents except by shipping them, because you didn't have many flights. Uh, the, uh, inter intercontinental flights were an incredible rarity. Um, there was no, no real synergy between the two of them, no, no written synergy, but they're fantastic intellectual synergy. So you'll find some touches in Keynes of talking about debt deflation. For example, one of the many silly ideas that neoclassicals came up with, and wait for it, they'll do it again this time too, they're doing it in Greece, was to argue for wage cuts as a way of solving the depression. Now, Keynes said, well, yes, if you cut, the wa cut wages, that will make a particular employer feel a lot better, uh, and maybe a general reduction might cut through pessimistic expectations by capitalists, but he said, on the other hand, the depressing influence of many entrepreneurs of their greater burden of debt, so Keynes can see that reducing wages will cause prices to fall, leaving debt levels where much where they are, and therefore causing the debt burden to rise, that will offset any cheerful reaction to the reduction of wages. And if it goes too far, the indebtedness, the, 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 the insolvency of those who are indebted could have severe in, in, adverse impacts on investment, making things worse rather than better. And therefore, he also talked about, well, he actually believed you had to cut real wages to get out of the Depression because he accepted the neoclassical theory of production that said that you had diminishing uh, marginal productivity. To get a high level of employment, he thought real wages had to fall. Now, I think that's wrong, but that's what he believed. One of the few remnants of neoclassical thought you'll find in the general theory. Well, he said, well, there's two ways to do that, however. You can actually cut money wages directly, which is the sort of thing the Australian government fell for, in the 1930s, or you can cause inflation. Keep wages, money wages constant, put price levels, prices up by causing inflation. Now he said if you do, you cut wages directly, you increase the burden of debt because prices will also fall and therefore the debt burden rises. But if you cause inflation while keeping money wages constant, the inflation also reduces the real burden of debt. And then he said having regard to the excessive burden of many types of debt, it can only be an inexperienced person who would prefer the former. Now this was Keynes having a bit of uh, literary fun. By inexperienced person, he meant neoclassical economist. So his, Keynes's focus was more physical and macro there, uh, looking at the impact of investment rather than the monetary analysis that Fisher was into. Uh, and if you want to look what, what Keynes brought to Minsky's theorem, it really comes down to the contributions about finance with what I call the dual price level hypothesis. I think Minsky termed it that as well and the way that Keynes analysed how expectations are formed and how finance markets behave. And the, on the first point, the dual price level hypothesis, in most of the general theory, Keynes talked in terms of what he called the marginal efficiency of investment, or the, which is a similar concept to what you saw Fisher talking about earlier. Um, in chapter 17, there's a few very, very brief lines where he says that investment is motivated by the gap between the asset price of assets and the, the cost of producing them. And he said investments motivated by the desire to produce those assets of which the normal supply price is less than the demand price. So you're looking at two price levels there. It's just, you can miss it in reading the, that particular chapter of the general theory, let alone the entire general theory. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny component of that chapter. Well, what he's arguing is the demand, the price you're willing to pay for an asset depends upon what you expect it to yield in the future and also appreciation. The supply price is the cost of production. So he's talking about a difference between those two price levels. Now, after the general theory, after 1936, he almost ignores the MEI analysis completely and focuses entirely on this issue of two price levels. So in that 37 paper, he says, the scale of production depends, of course, and that's Keynes code for something I've just realised, of course, depends upon the relation between the cost of production and the prices they're expected to realise in the market. So you're now seeing two price levels as motivating the level of investment. And looking back at the MEI analysis, the marginal efficiency of investment involves dividing the yield on an investment by its price. But there'll be a different MEI for every price level. So you, you can't simply tie that down in the same sense you can with calculus, where you can take 
the two levels is independent of each other. One will affect the other. And of course, the level of investment is going to depend upon your reactions to uncertainty. And that makes that asset price even more volatile. So he starts to reject the whole idea of using MEI, which of course you don't see in the textbooks. They carried on the MEI analysis and ignored the two price level stuff. So you have investors affected by fundamental uncertainty about the future, is that you can't form a probability on it, which of course neoclassical theory did in the efficient markets hypothesis. So he said, well, in the real world, how do investors actually form their expectations? Remember again, Keynes was a successful speculator. Okay? He actually knew what he was talking about. He managed to win the game of playing on the stock market. But he said, given this uncertainty about the future, you have to form very fragile expectations about what's going to happen. And they'll turn up in the prices you're willing to pay for capital assets, which means they're going to be extremely volatile, as we're seeing right now. Prices were up 2% yesterday, down 2% today on the stock market, as if the world improved by 2% on Monday or Tuesday and got 2% worse on Wednesday. Nonsense. Uh, now, that, therefore, that volatility will also have impact on people's willingness to invest. And therefore, the whole MEI analysis uh, is just irrelevant because there'll be a different one for every daily price. You simply can't work it out. It's a nonsense way of looking at investment. So how do you form expectations given this uncertainty? Well, for a start, you simply extrapolate current conditions forward. You presume the present is a much more serviceable guide to the future than a candid examination of past experience would show it to have been hitherto. Keynes' beautiful prose coming through once more. So you extrapolate current conditions forward. You believe the existing state of opinion uh, is based on a correct summing up of future prospects, so accept asset prices at face value, even though you might be scared about them. And you rely upon mass sentiment. We endeavour to fall back on the judgement of the rest of the world, which is perhaps better informed. This is the best written chapter in the general theory, chapter 12. Okay? When Keynes tries to put his ideas in a formal sense there, it gets to be very kludgy compared to the eloquence of this chapter. Now, that's an incredibly fragile basis for expectations. Therefore, financial price assets are going to be incredibly volatile in price. I see the major influence upon Minsky is actually being Schumpeter. And as Joan Robertson once described, Schumpeter is marked with the adjectives changed. Similar analysis, different uh, judgment on the value of capitalism. Now, he was the leading evolutionary economist. He's the person who really brought the concept of evolution into economic theory. And his book, The Theory of Economic Development, emphasised the role of credit in this cyclical capitalist system we live in. And that has tended to be ignored, unfortunately, by a lot of evolutionary economists as well. Now, he supervised Minsky's PhD, so it was a very, very direct influence on his thinking, uh, much more so even than reading Marx in the, uh, in the family, bedroom, family uh, lounge room. And he rejected, Schumpeter rejected the neoclassical view of money. The veil over barter concept, which is the way that neoclassical think they can treat money, just basically abstract from it. So mo their models don't include money in any meaningful sense whatsoever. And the belief also that money is neutral. If you double all prices and double incomes, you're neither better nor worse off. It doesn't, therefore doesn't change anything fundamental. That they're nonsense assumptions in a credit system. Schumpeter argued that money has real effects. He accepted that if we only had existing production of existing products using existing techniques and the economy is in or near equilibrium, then yes, the neoclassical view would be true. But he said the defining feature of capitalism is new products coming along all the time, new production methods, which disturb what he calls the circular flow. And money is an essential part of that disequilibrium process, which is a fundamental part of why capitalism is a powerful and successful financial uh, uh, economic system, except that when it falls into a financial crisis. And this dynamic affects both the price level and the level of output. Now, of course, if you double all prices and double incomes in a world with debt, you do make some people better off and some people worse off. Those who've got debts are going to be better off, and, th and that's going to include entrepreneurs. So money does have a, a genuine effect on the real economy as well as the, the uh, money, uh, price level, and therefore, rather than people who worry about money suffering from what neoclassicals call money illusion, effectively, neoclassicals suffer from barter illusion. They believe the economy is a barter system. They couldn't be more wrong. Now, when you're in a barter system, and if you look at Graeber's book, uh, it, it's incredibly hard to find any instances of barter in human history except between relatively hostile 
uh, social groups, on the periphery of those groups. Uh, that barter would involve existing producers using existing production methods to exchange existing products. And in that world, yes, OK, Volrath law will apply because you've got to supply something before you can get something back, so supply creates its own demand. But the major role of finance is initiating these new products and new production methods. And for those events, money is available, but it's just nonsense. And he says, in fairly convoluted prose, that it follows that in real life, total credit or total demand must be greater than it could be if we're only fully covered credit, meaning demand that can be generated by selling existing commodities. Therefore, credit demand extends beyond the existing commodity basis. So demand in the economy exceeds what, what you can get from selling existing goods and services alone. And that will borrow law is false because the additional demand comes from rising debt. And that rising debt then funds entrepreneurial activity, which wouldn't be there except for the increase in debt. Now, the entrepreneur, he says, needs credit. His whole focus is upon providing finance to the entrepreneur because an entrepreneur is somebody who has an idea but doesn't have a, the, the money to put it into process as yet. So he doesn't have goods to sell, which he can then use to finance a new idea. Of course, there are entrepreneurs who do have existing money, but Schumpeter does actually make it harder, harder for himself by assuming that his entrepreneurs are people with ideas but no money. That actually makes his idea harder to bring about. It's the sort of assumption you should make. So he's saying, let's just imagine that entrepreneurs are people who've got a good idea but don't have the money to put it into effect. So if you don't have that money, you've got to get it from somewhere else. You've got to borrow it. So you can only become an entrepreneur by becoming a debtor first. And that's an essential part of the process, not an accidental thing. It's essential to become a borrower, to be able to become an entrepreneur. In modern days, this means effectively approaching a venture capitalist to get your money. So before you have any goods or services or whatever, you've got to have purchasing power and you get that by becoming a debtor. And he says the classic debtor in a capitalist economy is the entrepreneur. Why is this not responding? Come on. My computer's gone. Ah, OK. Pardon me. I better go off the couple there. OK. So in a normal uh, production cycle, that you're producing existing goods and selling existing goods. You could use credit in that, but it wouldn't have any real effect. So yes, people do use credit in our current world for buying existing goods and services, but you can overlook that. That's, if that was all that happened, OK, Volrath law would be, would be OK. And so would Say's law, and Volrath law is just a more elaborate version of Say's law that supply creates its own demand. And therefore, aggregate demand would equal aggregate supply. Some sectors could be above or below, but overall the aggregate would be the same. But when you've got credit-faced financed entrepreneurs, their expenditure is not financed by selling existing commodities, but by credit. They get by spending power through the endogenous expansion of the money supply. So aggregate demand therefore exceeds aggregate supply in the sense that aggregate supply finances only part of aggregate demand. The rest is financed by an increase in debt. That can then cause the level of production to rise. This is one thing I find very hard for neoclassical to get their head around because we live in an economy which is not supply constrained, but demand constrained. There's excess capacity out there. If, the, if you didn't have the borrowing, that excess capacity would remain unused. When you have the borrowing, part of that excess capacity is used, output rises as well, but it's financed by a rise in debt. So credit is there, you've therefore got the idea of endogenous money very explicitly in Schumpeter. And he says, and so far credit can't be given out for the existing turnover of goods. It can only consist of credit means of payment created ad hoc, backed by neither money, which means by, by gold, nor by products already in existence. So, and it's the connection between lending and credit. And he said it leads us to what he regards as the nature of the credit phenomenon. And here's a classic statement of endogenous money. Credit is essentially the creation of purchasing power for the purpose of transferring it to the entrepreneur, but not simply transferring existing purchasing power, but creating it out of nothing. That's the next slide. This method of obtaining money 
is the creation of purchasing power by the banks. Not of transferring existing for lending from a saver to a borrower, the standard neoclassical way of thinking, but the creation of new purchasing power out of nothing. So it's classic endogenous money proposition. Now that finances investment. You can really regard the turnover of commodities as financing consumption and this type of borrowing as financing new investment. And that's what gives you growth in capitalism. So debt in that role plays an essential role in capitalism. But I'm very critical of the level of debt we've got into and the role of debt in our modern society. Of course I agree with Schumpeter here, you've got to have that to have growth going on and have innovation even if you don't have growth. Now, Say's law and Volrath law apply in the circular flow, which is the mindset that neoclassicals are in, but not entrepreneurial activity. Again, Schumpeter comes back to this point again and again and again. And I'm going to do the same until I hammer it into the minds of my students and also, I hope, the economics profession. So the, world, the reason neoclassicals can't understand this is they have this mindset of a circular flow where money plays no essential role and where supply occurs first and demand comes afterwards, therefore supply creates its own demand. And therefore also cycles are also irrelevant. Minor, minor fluctuations, they can be ignored as well. He's a bit verbose, but I'll show you the whole lot here. If I'm going to recommend any book you read after this course, I'd put that one down as the number one, The Theory of Economic Development. Now, just to mention, again, this mark with different adjectives comment which General Robinson made a long time ago. What Schumpeter's arguing is very similar to the circuits of capital argument that I showed you in Marx that Keynes should have used rather than the turgid D1 and D2 stuff he used in the general theory. And Marx talked about two circuits of capitalism. One being people having a commodity, selling it to get money, and then buying other commodities with it. And that's the, cir the circular flow that Schumpeter was talking about. And essentially, Say's law does apply there, and Volrath's law as well. You only sell in order to buy. Uh, there's a, there's a, therefore, supply creates the demand. But there's also, as Marx said, money, commodity, money. And that's equivalent to Schumpeter's entrepreneurial function. And Say's law doesn't apply there because the capitalist is actually wants to get more out than he puts in. It's not in money to money, it's money to money plus. So you want to make a profit out of it. So if the capitalist only got back what he paid in, he wouldn't make a profit. So the capitalist's desire is not to make supply equal to his demand, but to make the inequality between them as big as possible. So very, very similar to a more, slightly more formalised version of what Schumpeter puts uh, in a more, uh, I think, more systemic way, talking about the cyclical outcome of that as well as just the division into two cycles. So his aim is not to equalise the supply and demand, but to make the gap between them as great as possible. That's not thieving. Again, neoclassical think that means you've got to be a thief. Clara and Lionhop had used that analysis to argue against uh, um, this very approach, effectively, to economics. But you make a profit without robbing anybody, including the worker, in Marx's schema. So that's Schumpeter's entrepreneurial function. And that is that the capitalist you know, puts in less than he gets out. What he's throwing in is borrowed money, effectively, and then turn over that borrowed money. You can repay the debt and pocket the, some profit out of it, as I've shown you last week is quite feasible. So you've got a dynamic view of the economy, and it overturns the argument that money doesn't have real effects. Breaching supply creates its own demand, and breaching borrowed law as well. And that comes down to this whole idea of N minus one markets are in equilibrium. The nth has to be in equilibrium too. Again, it's an equilibrium analysis, therefore it's false in a growing economy. So what you've got with this is a link between finance and economics as well, because without finance, you wouldn't have economic growth. But what Schumpeter was looking at was the entrepreneur being funded by finance. Now, what we've really had in the last 30 or 40 years is the Ponzi merchant being financed by lending. And that's really what's given us the financial crisis we're in now, and that's where Minsky comes in. So he brings together Fisher with debt deflation and the role of commodity price inflation, making things worse if it's falling, Schumpeter on the entrepreneurial role of credit, and Keynes on two price levels and expectations under uh, uncertainty in how finance markets behave, 
and a link between finance and investment preceding the investment savings loop that most so-called Keynesians work with, uh, and marks on the tendency to crises and, and cycles to, bring, to produce the financial instability hypothesis. And I'll talk about that in the second half of the lecture.